Well, good morning. My name is Dwayne, and welcome to Directional Bible Ministries. This is a teaching ministry that is right that is called to rightly divide the Word of God for the people of God. And today is March the thirteenth. So, um, we have been making our way through the Book of Ephesians. Um, we have just now gotten into chapter number two. Um, of course, this has been a journey. Uh, for those of you that have been coming along with me, uh, it started out in the book of Acts, uh, where we, we, uh, we taught the book through a dispensational lens. Uh, we taught the book as a book of transition, um, a transition from the gospel of the kingdom, which the apostles taught, uh, to uh, the gospel of grace that was the mystery that was revealed to the Apostle Paul. And then we also uh, taught how that uh, as Paul was called out in Acts chapter number 9, there was a transition that took place from Peter to Paul, from Jerusalem to Antioch. It's a transitional book. And, anyone, and if you don't understand that, you're going to be confused. And we're going to talk a little bit about that some more today. Uh, and then, of course, we went into the book of Galatians um, as, you know, Paul made a strong defense that you cannot mix <coughs> the gospel of the kingdom with the gospel of grace. You can't mix law and grace. If you do, you end up with nothing at all. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And now we're in the book of Ephesians, and we're trying to rightly divide that book as well. But uh, when you come to Ephesians chapter number two, um, this is where uh, I think there's a good place here to talk about God's timeline. Because when we as people who rightly divide the word of God um, talk about right division, we're going to end up in Acts chapter number two. And I thought I would take a little while today and I may get through it, may not, we shall see, but uh, talk about uh, talk about the uh, the significance of of right division and where we get that from Ephesians chapter number two. Um, let me see here, just making sure that everything is working here. Uh, give me just a second. Uh, let me check this. All right. Vision. Recording. Okay. I'm trying to make sure that I am live on on YouTube. There you go. I am. It looks like that's working fine. All right. Yeah, it looks like it's going fine. So uh, I've been back and forth on where I should record these live uh, broadcasts. I have uh, tried Facebook. Uh, I've tried Rumble and I've tried YouTube. I think more people are on YouTube. Uh, of course, they end up getting posted across the board. But uh, the live recording, I'm, on, I'm just doing on YouTube this morning. Um, so anyway, so what we're going to talk about today is what I call God's timeline. And a couple years ago, I met a pastor on YouTube named Rodney Ballou. And Rodney confirmed 
some things that I was already beginning to question. Um, I was beginning to see, and, and I'd always seen a contradiction, if you will, between the teaching of the Twelve and the teaching of Paul. And we're going to talk about this a little more. And I began to, as a result of listening to guys like Randy White out of Taos, New Mexico, um, it, it began to confirm my suspicions <laughs> that I had not been rightly dividing the Word of God. Instead, I had been taught to simply homogenize it, harmonize it, spiritualize it, to make it seem that these guys are saying the same thing uh, and that these guys are speaking to the same audience. Well, they're not, and they're not saying the same thing. And that's what I want to talk about. And these guys begin to confirm in me what God had already stirred up, that something was amiss. Um, and matter of fact, I was teaching through the book of Matthew uh, when um, I began to ask these questions uh, because, you know, so many times we in the church, me, I taught Matthew as a pastor. I taught Matthew as a teacher uh, in Bible college. Um, you know, we, we, when we talk about the Beatitudes, when we talk about Christ's message to the Twelve, the calling of the Twelve, you know, we just read the church into that, you know, and read, we read things into there that really have nothing to do with the church. And right division is where that is solved. So I want to share with you uh, God's timeline that was presented to me, um, you know, years ago. Rodney Blue was the first one that I, I, I learned it from. Uh, but... Um, because knowing what belongs to you is just as important as knowing what doesn't belong to you. Just because it was written for you does not mean that it was written to you. Um, when you start reading things that were written um, to someone else, they're, they're not going to make sense. Of course, today the church teaches that it was all written to us. They see no distinction, many, between Israel and the church, the ministries of Paul and the Twelve. Uh, mass amounts of confusion result from that. And here, are, here are some examples that I want to share with you. In Matthew 20, verse 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, I, I was teaching through the book of Matthew. I came upon that verse for many. Now, you know, you can look at that verse and say, well, for many, that's not all. So you can see where the covenant folks get into, you know, election, uh, predestination. It's for many. It's not all. It's for some. It's, 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 a, it's a chosen few, but it's not all. In second, in 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6, who will have all men to be saved? Um, yeah, there's a difference between many and all, and to come into the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave him a, gave himself a ransom for who? For all. Not many, all. So is it many or is it all? That to me. Uh, presents a contradiction. Um, I'm not the greatest English scholar, but uh, many and all, look them up, are two different things. They are clearly saying different things. So the question is why? Um, Paul says in, in Romans 3, 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Okay, that's simple. A man is made righteous by faith, not by the deeds of the law. But when you read over in Galatians, also notice he also says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That's pretty simple there. We're making a strong case for 
Justification comes by faith apart from the law. Uh, in Acts 13, 39, Paul said, And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. So, you know, that great doctrine, justification by faith. Um, but yet, you get over and you read James and Peter. James, um, James chapter number 2, verse 24, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. That, that's a contradiction. He's saying that man is justified by works, and not by faith only. Also, Peter says in Acts 10.34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So Peter says, you got to fear him and you got to do works of righteousness if you're going to be accepted by him. The only way to understand these verses I have found is in 2 Timothy 2.15. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That means that the truth... The word of God that we hold in our hands has to be rightly divided. There is a chart um, that Rodney presented. This is not the exact same chart. There's many of these charts out on the internet. Um, but in the, there's two different charts here. And when we talk about rightly dividing, we have to, these charts very graphically present how we need to divide it. Um, there is a truth for them um, that is not for us. And there is a truth for us that's not for them. Well, who is them? The nation of Israel. Who is us? Gentiles that make up Jew and Gentile now, the body of Christ. So it's all truth, but it must be rightly divided, our truth from their truth and their truth from our truth. It's all truth, but it has to be divided. So Paul wrote what is true, and Peter and James also wrote what is true. But it'll be it, it's there's no contradiction when you realize that they were speaking to two different people groups. Paul speaking to the body of Christ, the church, Peter and James speaking to the nation of Israel. And we're going to use this chart as we work our way. And there's actually two renderings of this chart. This rendering shows what should have happened. Uh, God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. God gave the law to Moses. He, he raised up King David. He made promises of a future kingdom. All the Old Testament is about a kingdom, a prophesied kingdom. Um, and then John the Baptist comes on the scene and says, the king is here. And, G and begins to preach, the kingdom is at hand. And then, of course, the 12 disciples, that's what they taught. They taught that a kingdom was at hand. All of everything in what we're going to be calling time past has to do with the nation of Israel and a promised kingdom that was going to come. And, of course, Jesus taught that kingdom. He brought the presentation of that kingdom to the nation of Israel. Um, and ideally, what should have happened is after Christ was crucified, and Christ had to be crucified, uh, so that the sins that were committed under the First Testament could be forgiven, which is Hebrews chapter 9, 15, 16, 17. Peter 
presented that kingdom to the nation of Israel. Um, and they said, what must, must we do? And he said, you need to repent. You need to be baptized so that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, ideally, what should have happened is that the nation of Israel should have repented at that point, been baptized, and they would have rolled right into Daniel's 70th week. They would have rolled into the tribulation period. And at the end of that tribulation period, you know, of course, in the middle, the Antichrist will manifest himself, and everything in Revelation will be fulfilled. And then Christ would have came back and established his kingdom on earth. That's it. That's what would have, could have, should have happened, but didn't happen as a result of the nation rejecting Christ and his messengers. He reject, they rejected him. They rejected his apostles. They, re they rejected the presentation of the kingdom as offered by Peter at Pentecost. If they, if they would have, this is what would have happened. But they didn't. And as a result, <clears throat> Stephen was stoned. Paul was raised up. And you and I are now living in what is called the age of grace or the time of the church. This is us right now. This is the age of grace, okay? But eventually that age of grace is going to end and God is going to rapture the church out, the body of Christ out, and then he will focus his attention. Daniel's 70th week will start the tribulation period and God will be back working with the nation of Israel exclusively. So this is what should have happened. But this is what happened. And if you don't understand that, you're going to get confused. And I'm going to refer to this chart over and over as we make our way because it's very important to us. So, so that's my chart. Again, it's all truth, but it must be rightly divided. Our truth from their truth, their truth from our truth. Um, it is all truth that we are encouraged to rightly divide by Paul as he wrote to young Timothy. So what Paul wrote is true, that the just shall live by faith, that we are justified by faith apart from the works of the law. But yet what Peter and James wrote, that you can't be justified without the law. Um, both what they wrote is true. There's no contradiction if it is rightly divided. And we do not even have to guess about how to divide truth from truth. Paul told us that in Ephesians. And that's where we've been studying for the past several weeks. And uh, we are just now getting into Acts chapter 2, and I thought this would be a perfect time to present this timeline, God's timeline, and to help you understand it. And what I'm going to do today is going to be brief. Uh, it's not going to be in depth. You're going to, as you saw in those graphs, there's a lot of verses that we can get into. But I want to give just a brief overview, which is exactly what Rodney uh, did for me a couple of years ago. I just want to introduce it to you. Um, so we do not even have to guess about how to divide truth from truth. Paul told us that in the book of Ephesians, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, that's referring to Gentiles, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. So we Gentiles were called that, by the Jews. We, the uncircumcision, were labeled that by the circumcision, that at that time ye were without Christ. When were we without Christ? In time past. We were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We had nothing to do with Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, 
We had nothing to do with the covenant's promises, having no hope without God in the world. So what Paul is referring to there is in time past. <clears throat> the time past had nothing to do with the Gentiles. It was all the nation of Israel. Everything prior to Paul was time past. It had to do with Abraham, his descendants, the promises that was given to David <clears throat> about a future kingdom that would come. That is time past. We need to understand that. And during that time past, we were called the uncircumcision uh, by those who were circumcised. Um, and we were without Christ. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers uh, from the covenants of promise. We had no hope and we were without God during that time past. Now I'm going to continue here. Time past is when God called out Abraham, separated him from the rest of the Gentiles, and created the nation of Israel. Um, in Exodus eleven seven, 7, But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, why that ye may know how the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. God, in time past, called out, um, he set aside the nation of Israel from the Gentiles. And that happened dear, during, um, well, it happened with Abraham when he called him out from the Gentiles. Um, and then, of course, the children of Israel ended up in Egypt. And even in Egypt, they lived in the land of Goshen. God maintained a separation between his people and the Gentiles. In Numbers 23, 9, And from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. The people shall dwell alone and shall not <clears throat> be reckoned among the nations. In time past, the subject of time past was the nation of Israel and the prophesied kingdom that would come to them. That was the whole theme the kingdom and the king that would come to the nation of Israel. In Daniel 2.44, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall not be destroyed, never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. <clears throat> the subject of time past was a prophesied kingdom. And all of the prophecies pointed and led to this kingdom. Yet many people today erroneously believe that we're in the kingdom right now. We're not in the kingdom. The church is not in a kingdom. The church is not looking for, the, for a kingdom. The church is looking for a rapture. We're not looking for a kingdom. So when, when the Lord, the disciples' prayer says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is on earth as it is in heaven. That prayer is for the nation of Israel. It is not for us. Um, the kingdom is for the nation. It is the prayer of the nation that will be fulfilled in the millennial reign of Christ when, when Christ rules and reigns with a rod of iron for a thousand years. And all of the promises that were made in the Old Testament will be fulfilled during that kingdom age. Um, understand that during time past, there was a wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. Um, that made it impossible for there to be a body of Christ. You know, some people teach that uh, the church has always been. You know, that's a little bit of covenant theology. No, there was a wall of partition. Ephesians 2.14, He is our peace who hath made both one 
and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. There was a wall between Jew and Gentile. There was a wall between the nation and the nations. Uh, that's why the apostles were not sent to the Gentiles. If you read you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were not sent to the Gentiles. Jesus did not was not sent to the Gentiles. In Matthew 10, verse 5, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus' ministry was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And during that ministry, he was preaching through, through his apostles that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But it was a conditional offer. The nation had to repent and be baptized and do works of righteousness in order for that kingdom to be given to them. So God's plan was that the nation would be a blessing to the Gentiles after it repented and was baptized. That was God's plan. Once they had repented and were baptized, they were to be priests that would be used to reach the Gentiles. So God's plan, as you can see here in this, this chart right here, this was God's original plan, okay? That, you know, they would repent at the teaching of Peter. Okay? And therefore the kingdom would be established. Had the, here we see the kingdom prophesied, the kingdom at hand, the kingdom offered. It was offered at the preaching of Peter at Pentecost. And of course, they would have went into Daniel's 70th week that we call the tribulation. The kingdom would have been established after that. That is God's timeline. That is what could have, would have, should have happened if the nation of Israel had accepted their long-awaited Messiah. But of course they didn't. That is why they are called a kingdom of priests. Um, in <clears throat> Zechariah 8, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts. Where? In Jerusalem. This is referring to the millennial reign of Christ. And to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass. Ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. That is what God wanted. He wanted to make the nation a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles. In Exodus 19, 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. They are to be, they were to be, a kingdom of priests. Uh, First Peter, uh, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, different set apart people, that ye should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness, the tribulation, into his marvelous light, the kingdom. That is why John the Baptist came baptizing. He was preparing the nation to be the kingdom of priests that God wanted them to be. In Exodus 29, we see, um, And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, speaking of the priest's office, to minister unto me in the priest's office, take one bullock and two rams without blemish, the unleavened bread, the cakes, the unleavened tempered with oil, the, wafer, the wafers unleavened, anointed with oil of wheat and flour, shalt thou take them, and thou shalt put them in the basket 
bring them in the basket with the bullock and the two rams, and Aaron and his sons shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and you will wash them with water. The reason John the Baptist came baptizing was to prepare the nation, to consecrate the nation to the priesthood. So time passed it is everything before Paul, it is everything before Acts 9 and the calling of Paul. Now, some will say it, it ended with the stoning of Stephen, Acts 7. That was the official rejection of, of the kingdom. So you see Stephen here. Once they stoned Stephen, that was the death nail. That's when God went and raised up the apostle Paul. So that is time past. That is time past that we talk about. And Ephesians lays that out for us perfectly. Um, in, in Ephesians um, chapter 2, verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, you were strangers from the covenants of promise, you had no hope, and you were without God in the world. That is time past. Um, anything before Acts 9, uh, and many will say, actually the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, um, during time past, the nation's righteousness came through the law. Ours today is an imputed righteousness that was given to us by the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. It is an imputed righteousness. It's not my righteousness, but my righteousness comes from Christ. The nation's righteousness came through the law. Um, now, now we enter, once you come past time past, you enter into, but now, but now, and we get that from, from Ephesians chapter two, verse number 13. After that, um, after, after which we entered into, but now with Ephesians two thirteen, where it says, but now in Christ Jesus, Ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So who was far off? The Gentiles. You are now made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one. Who's both? Jew and Gentile, body of Christ. He hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. There's nothing separating Jew and Gentile now. We are members of the body of Christ, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself twain of one new man. We are a new man in Christ. We are a new creation. So making peace, so that he might reconcile both of them, both Jew and Gentile, unto God in one body by how the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. So Christ came, he presented the gospel. Uh, to the Jew, or the kingdom kingdom gospel, to the Jew only. But now, after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we who were far off are now drew nigh. And now that middle wall of partition that divided Jew from Gentile, the nation from the nations, has been removed. How? By the death of Christ, 
on the cross, and now we are one body. There's no enmity between us. Um, and this message is now preached to both Jew and Gentile. So the ones that were far off that were made nigh are the Gentiles. It is during this period that God cuts off his prophetic program. Understand, this is the prophetic program. This is what coulda, woulda, shoulda happened, but didn't. This is all prophesied. All of this is prophesied in the Old Testament. All of this is prophesied. This is not. This is not prophesied in the Old Testament. And that's why we believe, I believe, there's no prophecy taking place today. We need to be careful when we start applying prophecy to the body of Christ. All of this prophecy was about a kingdom, a kingdom that would come. This was not seen in the Old Testament. This was not seen uh, prior to the Apostle Paul. Um, God's it, So during this but now period is what we call it. During this but now period, God has cut off his prophetic program because this is what should have happened. Everything that was prophes prophesied about the tribulation, uh, the nation uh, being used as a kingdom of priests, you know, during this millennial reign, all of that should have, could have, would have happened. But now that has been cut off. It has been postponed, if you will. Um, so during this but now period, God has cut off the prophetic program. He saved the Saul who became the apostle Paul, and he gave them the revelation of the mystery as recorded in Romans through Philemon, as recorded in Romans through Philemon. So you see here in time pass is Genesis through Malachi, time past is Matthew through John, and even time past is Acts 1 through 9. So all of this is time past when God was dealing with the Jews only, with the nation of Israel. So we can't take anything out of this time period and apply it to the body of Christ without getting in trouble. The but now period begins with the Apostle Paul. Um, in 1 Timothy 1.16, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first, in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. So, the but now period began with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, I will contend, and right division will demand that he was the first in the body of Christ. So, the question is, when did the body of Christ begin? Now, many will say the body of Christ began at Pentecost. No. Paul said, in me first. In me first. So, Paul was the first member of the body of Christ. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to those that should hereafter believe on him. We are the ones that would hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So, <clears throat> Paul preaches a salvation by faith and not of works for the first time. Paul was the first one to preach a salvation that is simply by faith and that not of works. Now, this is where the majority of the church fails to see. And they try to harmonize, which I did for years, 
they try to harmonize the works gospel that was taught by the Twelve and the grace gospel that was taught by Paul. That's what the world tries to do. That's what the church tries to do. Uh, so when we read things that, like I said, where Paul says you're justified by faith aside from works, but then we read over here in James and Peter when they say that you cannot be saved merely by faith, but you're justified by your works. How do you, how do you harmonize what those, two, those three guys are saying? Well, you just look at it and say, well, we are saved by faith, but once you're saved, you're going to do these works. You know, the works are the proof of your salvation. That, that's how we, we harmonize it. Yeah, we're saved by faith, but, but once you're truly saved, you're going to do these things. That, that's how we harmonize it. And we, we simply negate the fact or even the possibility that these guys may be speaking to two different group of people about two different programs. Um, <clears throat> Paul said in Romans 16, 25, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. He doesn't say the gospel the twelve gave me. No, he says, my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation, the mystery that was kept secret since the world began. No one saw this coming. It was not prophesied in the Old Testament. No one saw this coming. Only was revealed to the Apostle Paul. So when we back up and start reading the church into Genesis all the way through the first nine books or the first nine chapters of the book of Acts. The church is not there. It, it was not revealed to anyone but the Apostle Paul who didn't come to faith until chapter 9 of the book of Acts. I become convinced that the majority of Christians today may be saved, but they are not established because they do not see the uniqueness of Paul's gospel. And they look at us who teach this as we're almost, as, as if we're heretics. Paul was the only apostle that was called to the Gentiles. I mean, Jesus told him when he was converted on the road to Damascus, I have set you apart for the Gentiles. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was not the apostle to the Gentiles. James, John were not apostles to the Gentiles. Neither were the other ones. They were apostles to the nation of Israel. Um, in Romans 2.16, Paul said, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, in other words, we're not going to be judged by their gospel, which was a works gospel. We're going to be judged by a grace gospel that was given to Paul. In 1 Timothy 1.11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. It was uniquely given to the apostle Paul. Um they do not preach Paul's gospel and the preaching of the Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. And unfortunately, that is not taught today. It is not taught in the church. Instead, what is taught in the church today is we conflate the message of the twelve with the message of Paul, and we end up with no gospel at all. And that is the entire subject of, of Paul's message to the Galatians. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And those that were troubling them were Judaizers, is what they were called. They were Judaizers. 
And the Judaizers were telling them that they had to be circumcised. They had to become Jewish first. They had to keep the law of Moses for them to be truly saved. Well, I submit to you today that there are a lot of Judaizers in the body of Christ today because we are teaching the same message that you have to keep the law. When you see the word commandments, that is referring to the law. And how many times did I quote, he that keepeth my commandments, it is he that loveth me. You know, well, the body of Christ is not called to keep the commandments. We're not justified by the commandments. We are justified, justified by faith and faith alone. And that was the message that was presented to the Apostle Paul and exclusively to the Apostle Paul. Uh, uh, Paul made this, and I'm going to wrap up with this. I'm at 40 minutes. Paul made it perfectly clear in 2 Corinthians 5.16 when he wrote, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Now, that's got to be a spiritual reference there because I know a lot of men after the flesh. I'm after the flesh. Okay, he's referring to someone special. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, so we knew Christ when he walked this earth, when we could talk to him, look at him, touch him, laugh with him, <laughs> you know, cry with him, uh, empathize, sympathize with him. Yet now, henceforth, we know him no more. Christ is gone. The Christ that walked this earth in the flesh was teaching and preaching that the kingdom of heaven was at hand to the nation of Israel, exclusively to the nation of Israel. And he says, we don't know that Christ anymore. We should focus, um, in other words, our focus should not be on the Gospels and the message that Christ, Christ taught exclusively to the nation, but the message according to the revelation of the mystery that was given to Paul after Christ was no longer in the flesh. We cannot be established until we realize that there is a difference we have to learn how to rightly divide truth from truth. All of this, all of this is truth. All of this is truth. This is their truth. This is our truth. This is their truth. This was written for us, but it was not written to us. This was written for us not to us. Simply put, Matthew, I mean Genesis through Acts chapter 9 was for the nation of Israel. After Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, Romans through Philemon is where the church is addressed. It's where the church is directly in view. That is to us. But once the church is removed, Hebrews through Revelation, that's not to us. Those, those, those books are preparing the nation of Israel for the tribulation period, the time of temptation that is going to come and the second coming of Christ in the establishment of the kingdom. So Genesis through Acts 9, nation of Israel. Acts 9 through Philemon, the body of Christ, the church of whom we are a part. Hebrews through Revelation, the nation of Israel. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. It's, it's way too much to cover, but we, we'll, do it, we'll do this in two sessions. So um, hope you've enjoyed the study. I'm going to post this. Remember, all of these things are posted on my blog, 
um, if you go to um, DwayneSpearman.org, uh, uh, all of these studies can be found there. It's got a link to my Facebook. Um, all of my studies from Acts to Galatians and now in Ephesians, this one, of course, will end up under topicals. Um, everything can be find, found in one place. If you want to study from the book of Acts, you can go here. It'll take you to the audit to this to the to the audio version of that, and then here it will take you to actually where I've written out the notes to that. And then uh, I've begun to go down here in the bottom and put links to where you can find uh, the other things that that I have talked about. Uh, for example, in Ephesians. Let's see, Ephesians session one, verses one through nine. Down here at the bottom, you can see that you can also watch this on YouTube. You can watch this on Rumble. You can listen to it on Spotify or SoundCloud. So I'm putting it all out there for you. Uh, and again, once I finish my study of the book of Ephesians, I will publish it. Just like I've done, you can get the book of Acts and the book of Galatians on Amazon Kindle either an ebook or a paperback format. So again, uh, that's what I'm shooting for. And uh, so next time we get together, we will finish talking about God's timeline. God bless you guys. Hope you have a great day. And remember that God loves you and he wants the best for you and he's working all things out for our good.